on this edition of In the Life. A visit with the oldest living lesbian in America, two German filmmakers explore gender and identity, and an interview with Madonna. Well, the gay community has always been incredibly supportive of me. Plus, Emmy Award winner Paris Barkley challenges Hollywood. All this and more on In the Life, America's lesbian and gay cultural news magazine. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by Michael A. Leppin, Richard M. and Peggy Danziger, Agnes Gund and Daniel Shapiro, Jeffrey B. Soroff, William J. Resnick, Rick Weiland, the Lily Achenkloss Foundation, the Gill Foundation, the Snowden Foundation, the New York Community Trust, the Mitchell Gold Company, in the hopes of eliminating all types of fear and prejudice, the Gay Network, <laughs> Gay.com, and the annual support of In the Life members like you. Welcome to In the Life, America's gay and lesbian cultural news magazine. Hi, I'm Katherine Linton. Whether you're in the darkness of a movie theater or in the comfort of your own living room, those images that you see on screen can expose you to a world of people, places, and points of view that are vastly different than your own experience. On this episode, In the Life focuses on artists who are bringing us a new way of seeing the world, especially when it comes to gender and sexuality. They are on the cutting edge of film and video, exploring new cinematic styles and techniques, and always working to bring original ideas to screens big and small near you. In this program, correspondent Tanya Barfield looks at the work of Ulrika Ottinger, a director who's been among the avant-garde of German filmmakers for nearly three decades. Hal German talks with Madonna and Rupert Everett about bringing their star power to a movie advocating alternative families. And you'll meet two African-American pioneers, one who's riding a new wave in television, the other whose remarkable life began long before TV was even invented. Uh, I wasn't in what you call a closet, never. But first, we bring you an eye-opening story about a special group of people in Connecticut who are coming to terms with who they are. They are men and women who are hardly ever thought of as sexual, much less sexually identified. But as Darius Dehaz reports, that is definitely not the case. Once a month, at the Gay and Lesbian Community Center in New Haven, Connecticut, a unique gathering takes place. The Rainbow Support Group provides a safe space to address the needs of a very specific segment of our society. Mentally retarded adults who identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. For more than a year now, this group has provided affirmation and support to this minority within a minority. You gotta make sure you wear comfortable shoes if we walk. This group is possibly the first group of its kind in this country that is discussing what it means to be gay and have a disability. In the fall of 1998, John Allen founded the Rainbow Support Group in response to a need being voiced from within the human services field. The group is funded through the Easter Seals Goodwill Industries of New Haven, Connecticut. From all over the state, I was getting calls from agencies uh, saying that they had an individual that was gay or was lesbian or were cross-dresser, and could they bring that person down for a service? we started to realize that, hey, maybe there really is a need for this. It's just groundbreaking to hear mental retardation and sexuality discussed in the same context. And also, uh, to take that one step further, to hear homosexuality discussed in, in that same context. You want to take your coat off and come sit down? Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you tonight? Judy Tompkins is our founding facilitator. She just has a wonderful understanding I sister, of I, I what it means to have mental retardation. Before, I, she I is heterosexual, but oh, she's in a way like a Dr. Ruth, where she just has a wonderful understanding of sexuality 
and what is a natural part of being an adult. And she just has this great way of getting people to talk about what's going on inside of them. You just want us to find more women. <laughs> yes. You guys, don't you have any women friends who get in the group? Developmental disability is a broad category that can include people who are mentally retarded. But developmental disabilities can also include autism, other kinds of severe learning disabilities. A person who is retarded means that their IQ falls below a certain point, which is actually the bottom two and a half percent of people tested. The number one thing all the group members say that they want is to meet other people, possibly have a relationship, have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or just to hang around with people who feel the same way they do. But other issues come up, staff not being supportive, sometimes people trying to change them, you know, trying to get the guys to date girls. It's hard to believe in this day and age that people don't know any better than that, but they don't seem to. <laughs> The first portion of each Rainbow Support Group meeting is a time to reconnect when the members and their staff have a chance to catch up. Then, each individual speaks privately with the facilitator. Sometimes it's just personal issues. You know, sometimes people just have a hard time. They have a hard time at work. They have a hard time with their boss. They have a hard time with their housemate. You know, sometimes they just want to vent just like anybody else does. But they always just want to kind of fit in. You know, they don't want anyone to think there's anything different about them, so they just want to be like everybody else. And I think part of being here is that they feel that way. Plus, they don't have to hide the whole sexual thing here. You know, they're just so relieved. Other people do this stuff, you know. It's like, oh, they can hardly believe it sometimes. During its first year, a core group of participants from all over Connecticut was formed, unique individuals who have overcome many challenges in their lives. I want to see you. Joe? Will, oh, I said I come here every month. And Alan, identify as gay. You help me learn to do better. To do better. Uh, yeah. Andrew is bisexual. <laughs> Pam is currently the group's only lesbian. And Ben is a straight man who cross dresses. <laughs> the point is, it's not easy. It's not easy for her. And plus, it's not easy for me. Joe knew who he was when he walked in here. I mean, he was just like, oh, God, there's other people that are gay. I'm so glad to see you. And he just had no problem at all accepting it. He's who he is, and he knows who he is. He says, I feel, I feel fine about this. I don't have a problem with it at all. My sister, she says, if you don't have a problem with it, she said, that's, that's OK, too, she said. So she knows you're gay. You know how she is, Adrian. You met her. Adrian Whoa. is Joe's direct care support staff. Mondays are her day off, and she, on her own time, will bring Joe down to the group. That is dedication. I hope that Joe would find someone. I really do. I would love to see him um, come to this group and meet someone that he's interested in and, of course, pursue um, a friendship first and then, of course, relationship if that happens. I thought there would be more women. <laughs> we all thought there would be more women. When I first met Pam, uh, literally within the first sentence of our in introducing ourselves, um, she came right to me and said, you know, I'm Pam, I'm gay, and can you help me find a partner? I would describe Pam as uh, a quietly surprising person. She, she may appear to be shy, but she's bold in some other areas of her life. Yeah, guess what? I just got on the internet. You <laughs> I did? Just got on I the did. internet. How did you get on the internet? Huh? Seems as though she was like a little dam that was held back for a number of years, and suddenly with the right environment, the right supports, and, and particularly this, this group, the floodgates are opened, and she's shooting on. off. <laughs> I enjoy it more. Ben is an individual that I think has had one of the most difficult times in trying to get to this point. He was in a horrible living situation where his support staff were trying to force him to conform to what they felt was right for him rather than listening to Ben. Because of the cross-dressing, it's been a different kind of situation with Ben that he had a little bit of trouble trying to relate to the other people in the group. But I think that he started to realize that it's all kind of the same thing. And 
he feels more comfortable. One of the things that was really exciting was at our recent holiday party here at the center, we were able to uh, provide some introductions for him to connect with, with the support group for cross-dressing and then made some instant new friends. What did that feel like for you then to see that? Feels like, well, if he could do it, I could do it. They feel that there is no one out there that really truly understands what's going on inside of them. And so that is really one of the, the biggest things that this group has been able to do is to break down that sense of isolation that people feel. You didn't see that over there in that corner over there? I didn't see wow. that. I, I saw that. I think I saw it. Could be. People with handicaps aren't allowed to have normal sexuality. They have no sexual outlets, and we kind of create problems for them, and they get themselves in trouble because they have no way of expressing their sexuality at any level. But if they could come here and see other people who were gay, who had normal lives, and were comfortable with who they were, that they could kind of grow from that and feel supported. Hello, my name is Betty DeGeneres, and my kid is the greatest. You know her. She's Ellen, and she's gay. For too long, gay Americans have suffered discrimination. As long as our sons and daughters are excluded from the basic protection of law, we must share that burden as a family. So let's, let's not, not waste, waste one, one child, child and let them all reach for the stars. To find the link, visit In the Life's website at inthelifetv.org. In our next segment, from the In the Life archives, we pay a visit to Paris Barkley, an African-American and one of the most successful openly gay men in television. Barkley is one of the creative minds behind City of Angels, a new CBS drama that has a predominantly black cast, something that is rarely seen in network television. Barkley gained his reputation as one of the savvy directors in shows like ER and NYPD Blue, among the first in those fast-paced, reality-based dramas. When we spent a day with Barkley in 1998, he had just won an Emmy for that very popular police series. Paris Barkley. I'll tell you a secret about the Emmy. I was so convinced that I would win the Emmy that I kind of knew, and actually a piece kind of fell over me. I'd seen all the shows, and I saw that show, and objectively I thought, this show is so great. I gotta win this Emmy. <laughs> Thank my uh, earthly higher power, Stephen Bochco, wherever you may be. You know what? I'm in the greatest place a man can be right now. You know, I'm really loved in my work. I really enjoy doing it. I'm honored. And, uh, you know, if worse comes to worse, I can always melt it down because it's supposed to be actual gold. This season, I've begun as the supervising producer of the show, which means I am the fifth ranking producer. And what I basically do is make sure that the show happens every day. I do want to speak to Jimmy Smith if he calls, by the way. Status meeting. I'm in charge of spending $2.1 million every show to make the show come alive. So that means that I supervise the casting, the other directors who are directing, the editing process, the hiring and the firing of uh, everyone involved in the show. The first scene again. Okay. <clears throat> And I want, if you could stand up, it would be great. Sure. And I think you have to imagine that you're actually sort of dancing in front of him when you're doing it. Okay. okay. Action! On top of being the supervising producer of the show, I'm also responsible for directing five episodes a season. And they're two different things. The producer spends the money, the director calls the shots. The director directs the actors, the producers make sure the actors arrive and are there and are hired and are paid. So basically, are the two responsibilities, while they seem to overlap, are actually very distinct. They begin and end when shooting begins. So sometimes I end up having to do both of them at the same time, but only five times a year, gratefully. It just looks more interesting than shooting back. Wow, I wonder if we could get someone in the DJ booth and do that. Shoot back out towards it, too. 
it's interesting being an openly gay producer on a show that's known for its sort of macho sensibility, I thought was going to be a predicament and difficult to navigate and a problem. But from the first day I came on the show, and actually I directed two episodes just as a director for hire, those are my first experiences. I found it exactly the opposite of what I thought it would be. We could do this, we could do this handheld if we, if we had to. It's really quite embracing. There are quite a number of gay people and lesbians involved in the production production of this show and you know what there's no differentiation in how they're treated on this series people can tune in on almost any show and there's going to be some gay person some sort of gay mix in there and they're each going to be different because they're each going to be from a unique vision on our show bill brockter plays john Thank irvin you. who's a very unique character Thanks. he's a little bit of a I sissy a he's a little fastidious yet at the same time he's heartfelt john. and he's instantly loved he's our most popular character he gets more male than dennis franz when he's on the show when I first started working in Hollywood, as it were, doing television shows, I didn't think that my sexuality was really going to be relevant, so I didn't feel it necessary to let people know. And actually, I was afraid that if they did know, they would have judgments and they would make decisions about me that weren't based on my personality, but what they thought a homosexual would be like. So I always kept it quite quiet. By not revealing who I am, I'm putting myself in more and more uncomfortable situations. I'm uncomfortable with people, and I've got secrets, and they don't really know what my life is like. So eventually it came out, and from the time it came out, some people didn't like me. And some people stopped speaking to me. And some people embraced me. So now I am faced with a life in which I do not have to deal with homophobic people in my career at all, because they're just not involved with me. And it's, it's, it's a lot better this way. Okay, let's look at this. I just have to look at two scenes, so it won't, it won't be too tragic. Boom. Can we just go to the close-up now? And just skip that whole scene. Grand departure hasn't taken... Oh, you know what oh, I'm oh, saying? Oh, 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 just oh, oh. blow away that whole wide shot, so you come right off of Sipwitz, and then you say, well, I think it's the Grand departure hasn't... Well, you got to get okay. Sipwitz sitting down. I still think he could have started. You got the garden spot, huh, James? Greek I started as a writer. I was writing musicals, writing plays, and then writing television commercials for advertising agencies. From there, I went to directing television commercials, and then I started a music video kind of production company. Let me argue for that. I think the biggest turning point in my life that allowed me to actually be a director was sometime around 1989, in the summer of 1989. I had started this company. It was not very successful. I really got involved as heavily as I could in drinking and drugs just to sort of assuage the pain of being a director who wasn't directing anything. Um, and I just fell into an abyss. You know, I fell into a total depression that lasted for about six months. <laughs> I think I was watching uh, the 4th of July fireworks on television, and a commercial came on for 1-800-COCAINE. They said, if you have a problem with cocaine, you should dial this number. Literally from that day on, there began a, a sort of an ascension in my career. I started to get a new clarity. I haven't had a single drink or any cocaine since that day, that first day that I went to that rehab. And suddenly, you know, I'm working like 14 hours a day, and I'm not exhausted. I'm exhilarated. And suddenly I'm involved in different community projects. I'm doing all this sort of stuff and I'm finding all of this life that I, did, I never had before. Ken is our much sought after director of development. Project Danger Food delivers meals to people who are not in a position to cook for themselves for the most part. People who are living with AIDS today. They don't have the family and friends that a lot of us would have if we were in the same situation. And they certainly don't have the means. And so for $5 a meal, we get to like just bring them a meal, a volunteer. They don't know. A stranger comes and gives them a hot meal on any given day, and they say thank you, and it really moves. All those in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Right now, I think the world is aching for tolerance, for lessons of tolerance. I'm trying to create a show, actually, a one-hour drama, where that's the pivotal um, crisis of the show, which is trying to make the world more aware of the fact that once you get to know someone, really get to know them, you tend to love them. Because that's what I live by. I live by the fact that there are only, I heard this a long time ago, there are only two kinds of people. There are the people that I love and the people that I don't know yet.
gritty realism of shows like City of Angels and NYPD Blue is in stark contrast to the almost otherworldly images German filmmaker Ulrike Ottinger favors in her work. A writer, director, and cinematographer for nearly three decades, her films were filled with gender-bending characters long before the phrase was coined. Her original style has long captivated scholars and artists alike. I just always uh, was in awe of Ulrike's way of using fantasy, decor, costumes, and making these opulent, rich films. She really, to me, is an incredible example of like the 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 way in which um, lesbian and gay artists have been linked with the avant-garde through you know this like whole century. She is um, an, a great artist, a great filmmaker artist who just follows her vision no matter what. As a filmmaker in the forefront of the German New Wave, Ulrike Ottinger's work has won a following among feminists, lesbians, and gay men. Partly because of her sexual imagery, and especially because of her refusal to conform to accepted conventions of storytelling. One film in particular, Madam X, an absolute ruler, has become an underground lesbian classic. I remember in the beginning when this film uh, was started in Europe, uh, there were a lot of critics from the, uh, a lot of feminist critic. But here in, in the States, this film was becoming uh, really the feminist film. Madam X, an absolute ruler, has um, an incredible performance by Tabea Blumenshine, who was um, Ottinger's collaborator in um, a number of her early films. And she plays the pirate queen, Madam X, but she also plays the figurehead of the ship. She becomes animated. She starts to speak as the figurehead of this ship. Gold. Liebe. Abenteuer. What's strange and different about this film is that it's anti-realist. It's completely throws story out the window, although it has a kind of a story. It doesn't give the, the you know, viewer many ways into the um, sort of strange rituals that this group of women aboard a pirate ship enact, except for through just looking and watching and wondering um, what's going on. The große Liebe im Leben der Madame X war eine Frau mit as the number and popularity of lesbian and gay film festivals have increased, so has the inclusion of Ottinger's films, often considered cult classics. Films often include transgendered characters and caricatures. For example, in the image of Dorian Gray in the yellow press, the androgynous Dorian is a man played by a woman. But Dorian's ambiguous gender is only one element of the strange and inventive surroundings. Still, it's an element that cannot be ignored, especially by a gay audience that's used to reading between the lines when watching a film. In one of Ottinger's films, Johanna Dark of Mongolia, the Trans-Siberian Express breaks down somewhere in the Gobi Desert. The male characters disappear, leaving only a group of European women who go and live among Mongolian herdswomen, temporarily becoming a part of their world. John of Arc of Mongolia uh, has uh, two important uh, facets of my work. The first is the pure fiction work, and the second, the documentary. In the first part, you have uh, the Trans-Siberian. In the train, it's like a museum of Europe, and we have all these travelers, you know, the music is important. And then there's a second part outside, really in the Mongolian desert, in the Gobi Desert, in the wonderful grassland with the Mongolians. 
her documentary work in China and Mongolia it has an attention to women, um, to daily life, um, and to even just sort of detail that I think really is a feminist way of looking and hearing other people's stories. As gay and lesbian filmmaking gets more and more mainstream and more and more narrative oriented and just sort of we all want to be like the boy or the girl next door, her crazy films about, you know, pirates or, um, you know, trips on the Trans-Siberian Railroad become like really to be treasured as something different. That just sort of sense of being completely confidently not in the real world um, that her, you know, really most stylized set pieces have, I think is a really appealing aesthetic experience um, because it's just, you know, celebrating outsiderness in a really, in a really, you know, larger than life grandiose way. I think my themes and my interests are so large and at the same time also so personal. So it, uh, I think it, uh, it should be interesting for everybody. You just spit it out. Okay, what's the best thing I could tell you? Um, that you've met a fabulous guy for me. Hello to everybody watching in the life. In early February, the Vermont Legislature's Joint Committee held public hearings on same-sex marriage. These hearings were in response to the Vermont Supreme Court's ruling that the state must provide the same benefits to same-sex couples that it extends to heterosexual couples. Residents turned out in record numbers to express their feelings for and against allowing gay men and lesbians to legally marry. It is my understanding that government is responsible for protecting minorities from injustice and abuse, not responsible for imposing minority values on the majority. Do you have a neighbor or friend who's gay, or a brother, sister, daughter, or son? Probably so. I urge you to consider them while making this decision. How can we say that certain men and women may marry but deny the same right to others? It doesn't make sense. I urge you to support the right of all Vermonters to get married with all that connotes. The legislature must now choose whether to include gay couples under existing marriage laws or establish a separate but equal domestic partnership program, which would be the most comprehensive in the United States. In late February, Green Chimney's Children's Services held its fourth annual conference at the Hunter College School of Social Work in New York City. Nine workshops were presented focusing on a wide array of services to GLBT and questioning children, youth, and families. In addition to social workers, young people participated in the planning and presentation of the conference. Longtime activist Joyce Hunter, co-founder of the Hedrick Martin Institute, focused on the difficulties that continue to face today's queer youth. We still teach LGBT youth to be ashamed of who they are instead of affirming them at a very vulnerable stage of their development. 18-year-old Jerry, a children's services client, talked about the many obstacles he has faced growing up and the positive outlook that Green Chimneys has helped provide him in his young life. Green Chimneys was like no ordinary place. It was like some, something that you wouldn't expect to exist. It's the best place to be, thanks to the very caring and devoted staff, my two teachers, also the people who told me, do not be afraid of who I am. On Valentine's Day, United States Representative Gerald Nadler from New York introduced the Permanent Partners Immigration Act at the New York Lesbian and Gay Community Center. The bill seeks to provide same-sex partners with the same privileges given to legal spouses under federal immigration law. One of the most egregious inequities that gays and lesbians face has to do with a shameful double standard in current immigration law. I have heard many painful stories, and after consulting with many of the groups represented here today, I decided the time to do something about them was past due. Currently, 13 countries recognize lesbian and gay relationships for immigration purposes. 
these 13 countries, including Canada, the United Kingdom, and South Africa, have shown us that it is possible to establish fair and humane policies to respect all families and to extend equal rights to lesbian and gay couples. It is because we value all our families that we are here today lending support for this bill. Under the Permanent Partners Immigration Act, gay and lesbian U.S. citizens will finally have the same rights as all other Americans to petition for their life partners. At the conference, members of binational couples were given the opportunity to call their partners abroad. Bob Dylan spoke with his partner in Germany. Happy Valentine's Day. And I miss you. And um, I just want to say that I think what we have here is a, is a really great start. It's a little phone call from one man to another, but a great, a great step for, for all of us here. Okay? And, um, and I miss you. <laughs> and I love you. Still to come on In the Life. To tell you. Madonna and Rupert are in a family way, at least on screen. Happy New Year. Hi. Happy New Year. And the life of Ruth Ellis, a century of pride. But first. Openly gay, lesbian, and bisexual characters have been depicted in movies and on television for quite some time now. But gender identity is a subject that is rarely addressed in popular films, at least not in a sensitive or serious way. But that changed recently when a critically acclaimed film about a real-life story hit movie screens across the country. Come on, turn up the music! Last year's surprise hit, Boys Don't Cry, exposed mainstream audiences to transgender issues through the story of Brandon Tina, who was biologically a woman but saw himself as a man. Tina was murdered in Nebraska in 1993. I had a dream about you last night. You did? What happened? Ow! Come on, tell me the dream. Someone walked me home last night. I think it was you. Well, this is a story of love and acceptance and being who you really are with all of your heart and all every cell in your body being who you are and not conforming to what it is other people think you should be. So you're a boy, now what? Come on. Got your mother. The film portrays Brandon's desire to live on his own terms and the violent events that take place when his friends are unable to accept his identity. You can't just keep running. You're gonna end up in jail. Brandon, what's going on? You want the truth, don't you? Boys Don't Cry has generated widespread acclaim, including numerous awards for actress Hilary Swank. You're like a little movie star yourself. <laughs> While Boys Don't Cry paints a chilling and tragic portrait of the consequences faced by one transgender person in rural America, a new documentary by independent filmmaker Monica Troit offers us a distinctly different take on the subject. Gender Knots is an upbeat glimpse into a community of transgender people who are living and working in San Francisco. Thank you. This is not a documentary about the average transgendered or transsexual person. It's um, it's uh, privileged people who are not privileged, you know, because they inherited something or they have all the security. These are exceptional people who um, are very smart and very brave and um, also, I mean, they moved to San Francisco. Beautiful. They didn't stay in Nebraska. I think it's going to be a great movie. He's beautiful. My kind of guy, guy girl, guy, guy, guy person. <laughs> San Francisco, it's um, a city which is famous for um, that people find each other, find, you know, that um, People who are um, different from mainstream, that they have um, the possibilities to get organized, to to uh, find their own support group. You know, they're all more, more or less like people next door, um, people you can meet and see that they are totally regular people, and um, there is also more to them than just their gender identity. You see them in their, you know, regular surroundings and you get the feeling, oh, they are quite nice people, you know, I could see that I, you know, be friends with them. Texas Tomboy is a video artist. I was attracted by Texas's energy and refusal to be defined in terms of gender. I think just my whole life I've really 
and into adventures and just seeing the planet and running around and being uh, finding everything really interesting and fun. And here comes Texas, who is almost behaving like a 16-year-old boy. Though Texas is born, I mean, is born female and is already in his early 30s. Uh, that was also Texas's first time to do this, and Texas was totally courageous. I really admired him doing that. It was effortless. It was absolute no fear at all, just excitement. Texas's jump out of the airplane that is kind of symbolizes what people do when they when they start this, you know, the courage they need to do this. It's not a fun ride to be a transgender person and to take hormones. Uh, I think it's really important to stress that taking hormones is not like uh, having a drink. It is, uh, it does affect your body and you have to take it really seriously. For me, it's been a really powerful way of feeling like I'm in control of my own body. That it's, um, you know, it's like, it's like saying, you know, my body belongs to me and I'm going to do with it what I choose, you know, to make myself happy. Until very recently, access to hormones was limited, and sometimes transgender people had to find alternative ways to get treatment. We got it on the gray market, and it was very weird, very risky, and um, not a good scene at all. Um, we went up to this weird little doctor's office. The doctor was about 80 years old, and he wouldn't let you do your own injections. He wanted that $40 every two weeks to give you your injection. Stafford uh, embarked on this journey a few years ago, then wasn't too sure whether um, he, she wanted to go all the way and be really male as a biological female and had second thoughts about it. Stafford looks very uh, androgynous and Stafford is quite tall. She is um, six foot something and has broad shoulders and so even when Stafford doesn't take uh, testosterone people would call her sir on the streets um, but Stafford is totally unaffected by this and is just Stafford. I've never felt male and I've never felt female and I don't really concern myself with gender I just let people go the way they will with it and if they're confused then I let them be confused and you know, I don't really have an answer for them. So, are you are you a boy or a girl? Yes. Stafford made me a compliment once. I really love that. Stafford said to me, "Oh, Monica, when I see you, I never think of you as female. I think of you as Monica." I really like that. Jordy Jones and I became good friends. Jordy is a gender variant artist whose work reflects a unique sensibility. I think when I'm 90, I want to be Quentin Crisp. Well, I think he's fabulous. Reading some of his experiences as um, the sort of young person whose transgressions couldn't be hidden, you know, I identified very strongly with that and have you know, a lot of respect for the humor and courage with which he lived his life and, and became so much Quentin Crisp. And I'd like, if I'm old, to be very much Geordie. Everybody has a cocktail of possibilities in them. I don't believe that anybody is 100% male or 100% female. You know, we all have to change the, the consciousness about this. We all have to try to work to make, for people to feel free and feel safe and secure in, if they feel they need to embark on this journey, to make it possible for them to not end up like, you know, a Brandon Tina. That's so gay. Homo! You faggot! So you're a queer, aren't you? Fag! Queer! Faggot! What are you, a fag? The next time you use words like these, 
think about what they really mean. <sighs> Better not be in next time. To find the link, visit In the Life's website at inthelifetv.org. A gay idol and a gay icon in one movie? Hal German has the story. Hello? He's leaving me. Oh, don't stop him. Just let him go, Abby. And then what? Rush over to my house and tell me all about it. She is a gay icon. He is rapidly becoming one. In real life, they're friends. In the next best thing, they're really good friends. You're the only woman in the world that I would like to be. Ow. By now, you probably already know the plot. Madonna plays Abby, a far too close to 40-ish woman who's about given up on ever finding her soulmate. Rupert Everett is Robert, who could be that guy, except he's gay. Abby and Robert share almost everything. Then, one night, yes, they share that too. And sure enough... I have something to tell you. Is it uh, bigger than a bread box? Not yet. What happens next is Dr. Laura's worst nightmare. Abby and Robert decide to live together, not as husband and wife, but as mom and dad. Unconventional, but it works. They understand each other, and I think they have a kind of candidness and honesty in their relationship that, um, that can only exist between a girl and her gay best friend. Madonna talked to In the Life recently about her new film and her old friend and co-star, Rupert Everett. You just have to be a father and a friend. Rupert is so, you know, fun and easy to work with that even if I hadn't known him, I'm sure, I'm sure I would have had just as much fun. But, you know, I think probably it added a little bit to the chemistry. Everett's star has been rising in Hollywood for years, but the role that put him on the map was this scene from My Best Friend's Wedding. While combing my hair now, while wondering what dress to wear now. His character was gay, and Everett was open at the time about his own sexuality. It certainly hasn't hurt his career. Everett has gone on since to act in roles from Shakespeare to Shakespeare in Love. I have a new one nearly finished and better. The Massacre at Paris. Even so, Everett told In the Life, when the chance to play another gay best friend came up, he couldn't resist. You know, I'd had such a response from America playing this charming, witty, debonair character that I was looking very much for something that, that had as its starting point that, but moved on slightly to something, you know, slightly more substantial. So this seemed ideal to me. Music. But Everett insisted on rewriting his role, which he says was at first too stereotypically gay. And that my character was a kind of TV sitcom queen from the 70s, uh, a flubby interior decorator. I wanted my character to be, you know, a normal man, really. And I didn't want this idea that a homosexual is, cannot have any feelings towards a woman. You could be a homosexual and have a, a, a little something with a woman, maybe, and it doesn't even make you bisexual. And I didn't want to show myself, uh, frankly, to middle America unable to f Madonna. It seemed unfair. <laughs> <laughs> Director John Schlesinger says Madonna's character needed a rewrite too, though for more practical reasons. In the original script that I read, she was a swimming teacher and um, Quite rightly, I think she said, I don't want to get my hair wet all the time, and uh, it'll be constant waits to get it dried and everything else. Why don't I do what I really know, which is yoga? So that's what she is, a yoga instructor, which is where she meets Ben, played by Benjamin Bratt. Are you asking me out on a date? Yeah. Is that all right? By now, Abby and Robert's son, Sam, is six years old. Robert's reaction? Hi, uh, this Abby Reynolds house? It's a funny, kind of quite 
bitchy scene, great fun. Better, but but it doesn't right, stay man. funny for long. You know, here's a woman who's in her sexual prime. She needs love. She needs romance. She has a loving relationship with Rupert's character, Robert, but it's not enough. It's been my daddy now. What? Soon, with their son Sam in the middle, Robert's jealousy turns to resentment. Abby and Robert take sides, and things turn ugly. I was watching the movie with a good friend of mine, this girl, and uh, she's gay, and she slugged me in the arm so hard, and she's like, oh, how could you do that? How could you do that? You, well, I won't say the word she called me, but <laughs> I mean, you know, she, and I'm like, excuse me, this is not me. I'm playing a character. Action. Riding herd over all the directors was Schlesinger, the openly gay director who won an Oscar for Midnight Cowboy and was nominated for another for Sunday Bloody Sunday. It would be quite nice if you went down on the, the, the sort of body sensuality as she's moving Turn over the, uh, and then go back over. into the position. Yeah. I didn't want the, you know, Madonna per se to be what the audience were really thinking about. So. We've been quite careful in how she's been portrayed, but she's a considerable dramatic actress, as well as uh, being able to handle the light, lighter stuff. Don't cry for me, Argentina. Still, Madonna, who won a Golden Globe for Evita, knows she has one group of fans in the audience she can always count on. Well, the gay community has always been incredibly supportive of me from the very, very beginning, and I am um, very grateful for that and have stuck by me through thick and thin. Do you think in generations to come, relationships like Robert's and Abby's are going to be more accepted? Absolutely, I do. Happy New Year. Hi. Happy New Year. What makes a family is not necessarily what we've been brought up to believe. We all have to be more open and accepting of families that are different. Our final segment spotlights a documentary about a woman who may not be a trendsetter, but we'd be lucky if she was. Her name is Ruth Ellis, and she's been proud of being African American, a lesbian, and out of the closet for almost all of her 100 plus years. It's a remarkable story that might have remained untold were it not for award winning director Yvonne Welbin, who was compelled to document this inspirational life. When was the last time you had sex? Oh, I guess I was about 95. Ruth is like us. She's a person that has lived, as she says, an ordinary life. And to me, she's had a few extraordinary moments. My name is Ruth Charlotte Ellis. And uh, I was born July the 23rd, 1899, in Springfield, Illinois. The first time I ever saw Ruth Ellis, she was dancing. I was at the National Women's Music Festival in Bloomington, Indiana. And I was trying to figure out how old she was. And the next day, I found out she was 97. I was really uh, surprised at her age and her vitality. That's how I met people, dancing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd go up and ask them, may I have this dance? And they say, sure. The more I talked to her, the more I realized that there was an amazing history in her. The biggest challenge was trying to figure out how to tell her story. I was in high school and the armistice was signed. That was a big day. Oh, five and ten cent store, they sold out of tin pans and things. Oh, we had quite a day. I made a decision to edit it historically. So we started at the beginning of the century and we just kind of go through her life and kind of make it a social history documentary. Martin Luther King made a way for the black people to have more privileges than they've had. The greatest thing I ever attended was when they had the march here in Detroit. You come in and you think you're gonna hear this story about a black lesbian. But what you end up hearing is an American history story as lived by a black lesbian. Uh, I wasn't in what you call a closet. Never. I wasn't. I didn't have anybody to... Now, my parents, my mother died early in life, so I didn't have to worry about that. But my dad and I had three brothers. 
I never heard anything from them concerning me except one night my girlfriend and I would made a little bit too much noise. My dad told me, next time you girls make that much noise, I'm going to put you out. As a lesbian and African American living in the 1940s and 50s, Ruth Ellis witnessed many cases of discrimination and homophobia. So together with her lover Babe, they opened their home to the disenfranchised. And soon the place became known as the gay spot throughout the Midwest. It was sort of a haven for the young people who didn't have any place to go. <clears throat> Mostly it would be men. Boys would come in and we'd let them stay there until they'd get on their feet. If they get a job, something like that, or maybe they want to go to school. In Detroit, they're actually um, building a gay and lesbian center for um, teenagers who are street, street teens who are gay and lesbian, and they're naming it the Ruth Ellis House um, in her honor. What was your greatest accomplishment? Joining the lesbians. I think that the lesbian community was dying for Ruth. I mean, it was like, you know, where are our foremothers? You know, has anybody been on this path before us? And I mean, it, it isn't just that, they, that we welcomed her. It was that we really wanted and needed to have a connection. One of the things that Ruth says has changed for her the most is that she is more out. She's out and she's proud. She's very out in her building. If anybody ever makes a homophobic comment, she goes, you know, when you're talking about them, you're talking about me. Did you want to see the old gym? I want to see the old gym. OK. We're not too far from there, so. My yeah. favorite moment in the documentary is when Ruth Ellis returns to Springfield and visits her high school and takes one last run around the gym. Every time I see that, it still kind of brings a little tear to my eye. Meeting Ruth Ellis changed my life in a number of ways. I count her now as, as one of my friends. The main thing that has happened is I've kind of taken on some of Ruth's life philosophy. She doesn't let little things bother her. She, um, which is great because I think you live longer, right? If you just don't get stressed out over the little things. Inhale up. And what other secrets of longevity did the filmmaker learn? She does stuff like she always drinks 32 ounces of water every day. And you know, I mean, she has these basic things that she does. Get on this old bike and go town. One of the things that I think that keeps Ruth so vibrant and energetic is that she exercises all the time. Ruth couldn't believe that so many people were interested in little old her. Ruth has received hundreds of emails because of this movie. And one of the most amazing was a woman said, I'm white, I'm heterosexual, I'm six foot one, because you know, Ruth is four foot eight, okay? And you would think that we are opposites, but we're not. And in seeing your story, I'm seeing myself. Living with pride, Ruth Ellis at 100 has played at many film festivals and was recently part of Creatively Speaking 2000, visions of new black filmmakers at Aaron Davis Hall in New York City. I think it's a wonderful piece of filmmaking. It highlights the fact that there are um, many aspects to the African American community. The fact that Ruth is a lesbian has been around and out for over a uh, her lifespan has, is really phenomenal. Um, I think she was really a pioneer in a lot of ways. May I present Dr. Ruth Ellis. The reason I called it Living with Pride is that she has always been true to herself. She's never been ashamed of who she is. She's always lived her life with pride. And I think if she can do it, we can do it. Living with Pride, Ruth Ellis of 100 will be screened weekly at New York City's Whitney Museum of American Art through June 4th as part of Whitney's 2000 Biennial. From all of us at In the Life, thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.
In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by Michael A. Leppin, Richard M. and Peggy Danziger, Agnes Gund and Daniel Shapiro, Jeffrey B. Soroff, William J. Resnick, Rick Weiland, the Lily Achenklaas Foundation, the Gill Foundation, the Snowden Foundation, the New York Community Trust, the Mitchell Gold Company, in the hopes of eliminating all types of fear and prejudice, the Gay Network, <laughs> Gay.com, and the annual support of In the Life members like you.